Great. Well, uh, so welcome everyone to the uh, AEI official book launch of A Search for Common Ground. Um, I was super excited uh, when Rick and Pedro asked me to host this conversation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Stephanie Sanford. I'm the Chief of Global Policy and External Relations at the College Board. College Board is a 100-year-old education nonprofit that's worked on a bunch of the same issues that Rick and Pedro tackle in A Search for Common Ground. Now, one of the reasons that I like this book so much is that it dovetails so well with a lot of things I've been worried about in my life. In fact, I wrote a book called Civic Life in the Information Age that looked at the intersection of technology, generational change, and social capital. And I worried about the effects of technology and democracy. And things are much more polarized today than in those early tech boom days. I don't need to tell anyone that we're in a time of bitter polarization. This book, A Search for Common Ground, is positively countercultural and deeply engaging. In my view, it's a book that everyone could and should read. See, two, two super smart leaders in the education field who often found themselves on different sides of issues decided to engage for a year on topics that they knew they disagreed on. And they decided to do that countercultural thing in an utterly retrograde format. They wrote letters. And while they disagree on some educational issues, our epistolary policy panelists also have a lot in common. Both have been public school teachers, professors, authors, commentators, and consultants. Both are widely published in scholarly journals as well as elite media. Both have offered many books and edited volumes that are frequent contributors in other collections as well. Rick Hess is now resident scholar and director of education policy studies at AEI. He tackles both K-12 and higher education issues. He is the author and co-author of 10 books, including Breakthrough Leadership in the Digital Age, Using Learning Science to Reboot Schooling, and The Same Thing Over and Over, How School Reformers Get Stuck in Yesterday's Ideas. Rick started his career as a high school social studies teacher and has taught at six college campuses. Pedro Nogueira is the Dean of the USC Russia School of Education and is a sociologist whose research focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions. He's published over 250 articles and is the author, co-author, and editor of 13 books, including Excellence Through Equity and Unfinished Business, Closing the Achievement Gap in Our Nation's Schools. Pedro also began his career as a public school teacher and has taught at four college campuses. Honestly, gentlemen, I am in awe in the, of the breadth and productivity of your work. I've written one book, I can't imagine writing 23. See, the three of us now have something in common. We are letter writers. So for this book, you two wrote 72 letters back and forth, roughly 36 apiece. Now, I read early on that this project was inspired by the correspondence of Jefferson and Adams. They wrote over 380 letters over the course of about 50 years. But you did yours in one year. So you produced about the 10th of the throughput and about a 50th of the time. That's not bad. So you're both writers. You both exchanged a ton of correspondence. And you're on your way to being Jefferson and Adams. <laughs> So before we dive into my questions, um, I, given all the time that you all have spent corresponding over this year, I'd like you to give one sentence to describe your pen pal. Pedro, how would you describe Rick? Provocative. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, but that's actually what I like about him. What I've liked about Rick over the years is um, his willingness to kind of say what he thinks um, and, um, you know, I think not simply for the sake of um, engaging in kind of diatropes, but to really look at issues closely and to think about them. And that's why when he invited me to join him in this um, journey of, of exchange, I said yes. That's awesome. So, Rick, how would you describe your pen pal? You know, Pedro is an ed school dean, um, an unapologetic progressive who I have nonetheless always found extraordinarily interested 
in practical things and in hearing ideas that he might disagree with. So I, I think that's uh, fascinating and awesome. And it really comes through in the book. Um, so we're going to spend the next uh, 45 minutes or so really exploring this book. And I, I want to focus our conversation on four primary topics. Uh, one, um, how the book came about, especially the format. Uh, what, do, what did you learn from each other? Um, what impact did the pandemic and the racial unrest have on this project? And then what do you hope readers, educators, and the larger world uh, will learn from this book? So one of my greatest challenges of this next hour or so is keeping two of the most eloquent and thoughtful people I know focused on kind of quick responses. Since we've got less than an hour and we've got an entire world of problems to solve. So let's get to it. So I may facilitate you just a little bit and we'll leave a little time at the end for some audience questions. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, how did this collaboration come about? And especially, how did you decide you, ought, you decide that you ought to write letters to each other? Um, you know, it started, it was uh, late 2019, uh, November, December 2019. I'd been noodling on doing something, something like this for a while. And part of the trick was to figure out who would it be uh, constructive and interesting uh, to do this with. Uh, and I thought of Pedro, who I've never known well, but who I've known for 20 years, a little bit, and who I've always admired. And I thought, hey, here's a guy who seems sensible, who, well, who seems like I disagree with him on most things, but seems sensible in how he talks about the things we disagree about. A guy I've really liked when I've interacted with him. And so I reached out and uh, we weren't really clear when I reached out exactly how we were gonna do this and what the format was going to be. Uh, really, I just reached out to Pedro to say, hey, do you wanna try to have a conversation where we actually try to understand each other rather than just yell at each other? So Pedro, so you get this call from this guy you sort of know, and he says, hey, let's do a book about stuff we disagree on. What'd you think? You know, it didn't take me long to say yes. Um, and the reason why is because I value the exchange. Um, I, you know, and even before Rick, I, I valued the um, debate. I, I value, um, you know, probing complex issues with people I don't necessarily agree with. I, I think one of the problems in this country, and it's certainly a problem in academia, it's very easy to just talk to people you agree with and, and to affirm each other's positions and not acknowledge um, the, that others don't see it that way and they may have a legitimate perspective. So, you know, I was actually quite busy when Rick invited me. I was in the middle of writing another book and I said yes, thinking, well, we'll drag this out over the next few years. But instead, what happened is each time I get a letter from Rick, it would provoke me. That's why he said, I said he was provocative. It would provoke me to want to respond. So I'd put down other things to write my letter. But the letter writing process is also very interesting because it forces, you have more time to think about what mm -hmm. you're saying. Um, if we had done this as a verbal exchange, you don't get that same time to be as thoughtful and reflective. And so the letter writing process, I think, made it really different too. So how'd you come to that? Did you say, hey, this format would be really interesting? Or, you know, I, I mean, I'm a letter writer. I'm married to my husband because of the letters we exchanged. I still have my first letter in a shadow box that I wrote. It was to my great grandmother when I was five. So had you been letter writers or did you sort of come to this in some way that, that this would be a, 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 an interesting, um, productive format? Yeah, you know, but I, I don't think it was conscious. Uh, you know, while we were in it, I was, you know, I think we we reflected a bit on the Jefferson Adams thing. But honestly, we were, you know, we said to ourselves, look, um, as, as, as Justice Prater put it, right, we, it's very hard, whether you're on the right or the left right now, to find yourself involved in conversation where you actually feel smarter at the end of the conversation than you were at the beginning of it. It's easy to reaffirm each other. It's easy to yell back and forth. It's hard to actually find time to just talk. And so that's what we were really interested in. 
and try, not trying to find agreement, but trying to find understanding on a given topic. And so I think what occurred to us was the only way to do this was to exchange back and forth somehow. And so what we did was we started, uh, I think actually the first chapter was gonna be school safety, which didn't make it into the book. It was kind of that first terrible pancake. Uh, I think I wrote something to Pedro on school safety and he wrote, and we did it. And it just wound up falling away during the uh, editing process. But we pretty quickly got into a rhythm where, you know, I would write six or 800, 900 words. Pedro would read it. A lot of times with Pedro, the same day. <laughs> he sometimes yeah. back with these beautifully written kind of 800 word thoughts. And then I would need to sleep on it and reflect. Uh, and I'd write back a day or two later and we'd go back and forth. And like Pedro said, it's just, you know, you, all of us sit on so many panels, we're on radio shows, you're on TV. And there, the coin of the realm is the quip, uh, the quick put down, the quick response. And this just opened a whole different kind of conversation that, I, I, you know, I'm not really used to having. So, uh, so you did it by email. I had visions of you running down to like to waiting, you know, waiting for the mail. Is it there? Is it there? Wasn't that old school? <laughs> <laughs> so kind of old school. Um, so um, had you been, have you been letter writers in the past? I mean, in earlier in your lives that sort of took you to that, you thought maybe this would be a format that would be particularly engaging or do you really just fall into it? It's funny. I used to be a letter writer. I don't, you know, with by hand in the envelope. I haven't done one of those in a long time. But I do um, engage in exchanges via email. And mm -hmm. so that's the kind of our modern form format uh, for doing it. Um, but, you know, I, I hadn't done something like this, an exercise like this before. Um, I, I don't know if you recall this, Rick, but we were at an event together a few years ago, put on by Convergence. Do you remember that? And it, it was, um, uh, I think we both agreed it was a really, it was a waste of time <laughs> and we may not agree on why, but it was a kind of typical education event where there were a lot of talk, but nothing of substance being said. And, um, and, and that I react to that. And I think Rick, Rick's reacts to that too, right? That is that this tendency to um, use slogans and um, for, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, talking point rather than really delving in. I'll just share one thing. We did a, an event. I did an event on the 60th anniversary of Brown uh, versus the Board of Education. And I invited several people to stage a debate on state of whether or not we should continue to pursue um, racial integration in schools. And I had kids in the audience to be the judges. And it was such a disappointment, even though yeah. I got people from different points of view to be on the panel because everybody said the same thing. They said, oh yeah, we're all, we all like integrated schools. I said, but the schools are not integrated. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and, and I, it just, I think speaks to the fact that people are more care, concerned about saying the right thing than they are with really addressing what's going on and what we should do about it. Yeah, no, that I think, I'm, and I'm certainly not a letter writer. In fact, I, I tend not to even have extended private email correspondence because mm -hmm. My general philosophy is if you're going to bother writing something, you might as well put it out there because otherwise I'd rather just, you know, yeah, my kids or so, I don't know, something. Um, but, you know, the, 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 what Pedro and I really, we did, what we talked about very early on not wanting to do was what Pedro just characterized, this habit, the Blue Ribbon Commission habit of the trick is to get Republicans, Democrats to agree on something. So you wind up with weasel words and a whole bunch of like meaningless kind of throat clearing that everybody can put their name on because you don't know what the hell it means. So everybody can kind of get behind it. And what we said, we didn't, you know, what we wanted to do was see if there were places where we could find common ground, but it was more important to talk honestly and clearly than to find ways to agree. And I think that's what made it such an, such an energizing and heartening kind of experience because the conversation was rooted in honesty rather than rooted in what words could we come up with that would fudge our differences. No, I mean, you, you're the, your chemistry is obvious and the book is really engaging because of the format. Um, so let me, um, so I'd love to know kind of what have you, what did you most learn from each other 
I mean, what's the one thing, or did you have a thing that particularly surprised you about it, that you learned about one another in the exchange? Um, you know, I mean, I, I'll say, you know, especially uh, in the course of the pandemic, because we mm -hmm. mostly wrote the letters between last January and June, say, and we did, you know, then we did a couple of months editing later in the summer. Uh, and especially during the pandemic, when you're not interacting with people and you're not actually talking to them and so much dialogue is two-dimensional. It's what you know you hear said on a webinar that you're, you're talking to somebody or it's what you see written. Um, that it was easy for me to get frustrated with a lot of what I heard coming out of schools of education, a lot of the way people were talking about inequity and issues of race. And at a gut level, I, I, I just, you know, I am as frustrated by where they're going as I'm sure they are by the things they're objecting to. And for me, the thing that I was so grounding about talking to Pedro was look, Pedro unapologetically argues that big things need to change. And that's fine. I, I, you know, and I think we actually wound up agreeing a little bit more about some of that than I might have expected. But Pedro wasn't interested in trying to cancel Shakespeare or trying to cancel To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, when I would talk about, you know, the Smithsonian last summer saying that uh, being not, you know, that working hard is white, um, Pedro would like say, I'm not going to defend that. When Kip uh, moved to cancel, work hard, be nice, saying this was bathed in white supremacy, Pedro said, I'm not going to defend that. So, I mean, one of the things that was so heartening for me is that Pedro, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Pedro, so I've certainly push back if I'm mischaracterizing but it felt to me like Pedro was making an incredibly useful, important distinction between things where there are real inequalities in American life and we have to be honest and confront them, even if it might be easier not to, and not to let people, um, people with uh, troubling or foolish hobby horses um, hijack uh, important conversations. And it felt like that's a distinction that Pedro makes day in, day out, that so often gets lost in the, the, the public debate. So, so Pedro, what about you? What, what surprised you um, about your exchanges with Rick? And, and do you want to sort of respond to, to, to Rick's characterization of, of, uh, of, what, of, what, he, of what was both surprising and, and, and really compelling about the arguments that you made? I think what was surprising is um, some of the areas where Rick conceded or, and acknowledged and agreed, yeah, you're right, that's an issue, that's a problem. When we talked about inequality in society, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that he agreed, that's a big problem. That to me is the big problem facing American education. So um, the fact that we didn't have to fight about those things, I think a lot of the left-right battles are over symbols. Um, I, I, and that when you start to peel away, they're kind of silly. I, I'm against censorship of any kind, right? I don't think our, we should be trying to keep books away from kids. We should try to get books in the kid's hand and then teach them to think critically so they can interrogate those books. So I think we both approach this differently. The other thing, and this is something that, I, that became clear during our exchanges, at a certain level, we're both pragmatists. And, and, and by that, I mean, we're more interested in solving problems than simply fighting. And, and that makes a real difference. You know, when you're, when you're working with a superintendent who's trying to figure out how to address a complex issue, they don't need ideology. They need, they need practical advice. How do I, if we're, you know, how do I address this issue? with my in my district and you know both of us have had that kind of experience the other thing is you know i i travel the country when when we could travel <laughs> i used to travel yeah. and i travel to lots of red states and small towns that are not bastions of liberalism and what i actually find is that in many communities we have far more in common than it seems that mm -hmm. at the level of values Americans agree with each other a lot more. And our politics have been created in a way that heightens our differences. But I, I'm actually less discouraged. Um, I, I think if you just 
don't watch the news as much, <laughs> you mm -hmm. start to feel this might be more hope for this country. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about that. I'm intrigued by the notion of pragmatism and particularly as I, I mean, I know, you know, sort of both of you in the field, but studied up a bit. I mean, the, 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 common, the commonalities in, in your backgrounds in education and this notion of, of pragmatism. Um, what were some of the things that you found that you really agreed on? You sort of touched on them, but I'm really intrigued that in an age of polarization, in a book that was designed to, to you know, to talk, have people correspond who might be from sort of different ideological perspectives, that, that a big takeaway is you liked each other, you found common ground, you, you know, you have this common pragmatism. What are some of those things that you really found that you really see eye to eye on? Um, I, you know, I'll throw out two or three. I mean, I think one is testing is obviously huge in these conversations. And it tends to be, uh, you know, the right left or not even right left. There tends to be a for testing versus against testing debate. And again, I think this goes to Pedro. Am I, am I talking about there's a degree of pragmatism in our thinking? I think we both agree that that is an utterly stupid debate. Uh, if there's one thing you see teachers do from the first day of any, any competent teacher does from the first day of school, they're testing kids in a million little ways. What did you take from that story? Hey, let me see what you drew there. There's a million ways they're assessing and assessment should serve a purpose. It should be help educators do their jobs. It should help parents make sure their child is being well served. It should help folks spending public dollars on schools be confident that those dollars are being spent responsibly. And Pedro and I, I think, you know, we agreed fundamentally on that in that so many of the problems in our assessment debates is how we have got caught up uh, in ideological hobby horses rather than actually thinking about, is this useful to a parent? Is this useful to an educator? You know, a second one is choice. Choice is another huge dividing line. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty unapologetically pro-choice um, for education savings abouts and vouchers and charters. And, you know, Pedro's, I think, highly skeptical of ESAs and vouchers. Pedro's uh, had a long career of being open to charters. Um, but when we talked about choice, what's it for to empower folks who are trapped in bureaucracies that aren't serving their kids' needs, uh, to give educators and communities a chance to start better schools, um, but also that choice is not a magic solution, that choice is uh, very much a question of how it's getting, you know, who's, you know, how are the choice systems designed? What are the incentives driving? You know, and a third thing I'll just throw out there. And so again, I think, uh, do we agree on testing or choice? No, I mean, we come down in different places, I think on a lot of particulars, but there's lots of good faith agreement on which this rests. You know, a third thing that's interesting is privatization, the role of for profits. Um, you know, you would think that this is one where there is absolutely non no common ground. I'm a guy who believes for profits have an important role to play in education. Uh, many of folks on the left uh, would love to see for-profits outlawed in K-12 and higher ed. But as Pedro and I talked about it and talked about kind of the analogies and uh, the New York subway system and what Pedro, you know, characterized as kind of just the grandeur, the nobility of everybody, rich and poor, having this hugely successful common system to rely upon. And, and I'm me making the point that, yeah, there's a lot to be said for it in New York that doesn't necessarily work well in Topeka. Uh, or Tacoma or other cities with very different dynamics and infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we talked about it, I think we found a lot of mutual understanding and insight um, in place of the accusations that, you know, we usually hurl back and forth in that debate. How about you, Pedro? Um, what, what did you find um, that, uh, you know, where, I mean, where you found more common ground than you expected? So what's, what's important um, to keep in mind is, although the title is A Search for Common Ground, that wasn't the objective, right? The mm -hmm. objective was to actually air out the issues, to mm -hmm. exchange, to look at them, and to listen and react to each other. Uh, and if we came to a point where we agreed, so be it. If we didn't, so be it, right? Um, so it really... It, 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 I, I think it's very important for the listeners to understand that. We didn't come predetermined that we're going to reach agreement on these issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, just recently, we wrote an uh, op-ed together that we hope will come out soon, 
And this, the, the objective of that op-ed was, are, can we come to some agreement around some issues related to schools reopening? And um, I thought we need to get on the phone and talk this through. And Rick said, no, I don't think it's gonna be a problem at all. And turned out we finished the, le- the op-ed in what, a day or two? <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I, so I th- what does that say? I think it says that uh, two things. One, when you're not an ideologue, right? Um, that is, you're not just trying to, to protect a position or you're really looking at the issue and trying to understand it, then you can see all the different sides of an issue, right? And you can reach common ground. And, and mm-hmm. when you are um, open to hearing perspectives that are different from your own and, um, and actually taking them seriously, um, that also opens up dialogue. So, you know, so it's on some of the issues Rick just mentioned, charter schools. Um, when people ask me, you know, how do I feel about charter schools? I say, which ones? Some are good, some are not good. I'm not gonna defend bad schools. I will say the same thing about public schools. Um, and then, you know, so testing. I'm not pro or con, I'm for what purpose, right? So I'm reframing the issues and I think Rick was, was certainly willing to do that as well. And I think that's a different way of approaching the issues than we see typically play out um, in the public discourse. You know, and Stephanie, just just about, just on the testing one, for example, you know, one thing we talk about, in the, you know, I've tried to make this argument for years with reformers, and I had much more success with Pedro, right, which is interesting. <laughs> reformers are my people. And I, I remembered, like, during uh, the opt-out with the Common Core assessments, um, I, I would say, you know, people would say, how can these parents opt out? They don't opt out of taking their kid to the pediatrician. What's wrong with them? And I would always say, well, look, you take your kid to the pediatrician, you sit in the office for 20 minutes, pediatrician sees your kid for 20. At the end of that, they tell you how your kid is and they give you specific things that you need if your kid needs any help. 40 minutes of your life and your kid's better off. I'm like, there's New York assessment. They want kids to sit in a room for eight to 10 hours. Six months later, they're gonna mail you something which nobody on earth understands. And mostly they wanna use this so they can put a grade on your school. What in God's name is com- like Pedro and I, when we talk about this, there's an, un- you know, across our ideological divides, there's a practical understanding, which is often missing with people who are supposedly on my side. And, and, and you know, the other thing that came up was that this op-ed that Pedro just alluded to. One of the reasons as we were writing it, I didn't think we need to get on the phone because it was interesting. Pedro would write in these phrases and I'm sure I did the same to him. He would write in phrases and my first impulse would be, man, I got to go to war on this. I can't let him sneak this in. Uh, but having spent all this time going back and forth, my degree of comfort with where he was coming from was such that I would just write a comment bubble and I'd say, hey, here's how I'm hearing it. Here's why I'm not good with it. And so it turns out that we put just tons of, I don't know, understanding or trust in the bank mm-hmm. then that's there going forward for these kinds of efforts. And um, I think that stuff is sorely missing in so much of what we do today. No, it's so interesting. So I really do hear a sense of trust, pragmatism, problem solving, concreteness, um, less abstraction, you know, less ideology, less sloganeering. I, uh, uh, no, I, I see, uh, I'm intrigued that um, to, to say you weren't trying for common ground, a search for common ground explicitly, but rather, is it, is it more accurate to say you were searching for um, understanding each other? And if you understood each other, then you might find common, if not necessarily common ground, ways that you would agree on the ways that you would solve particular problems and particularly particular problems in schools or in districts, not in, you know, a, an abstract debate in Washington or somewhere else. Is that, a, is that sort of a fair uh, sort of summary of sort of the insight? That's, yeah, and that's I great. So. Now, yeah. I, I should also say, though, we have the luxury of not being decision makers, right? That is, the, <laughs> neither of us is running a state or much less the federal government where we actually have to take ideas and put them into policy. Uh, we're not superintendents, right? So we are um, critics, we are observers, we are um, partners with, with decision makers, but we don't hold that position. And I have a lot of respect for people who do. I know how hard it is. I know that a lot of times there are no easy answers here. Um, and it's very easy to just throw darts from the sideline and, and, and point out what's wrong. Very different to be in the position of leadership and have to figure out, okay, what do we do? 
Um, and how do we make sure this starts to impact things in a positive way? That, I, I you know, if anything, I, I would say that anybody who's actually held a leadership role would be less um, quick to criticize because you understand how hard it is to lead big institutions, much less big states and governments. Yeah, that's why uh, hardly any pundits have ever actually run it. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say that people who ought to be, I think, perhaps taking a lesson from this model. I mean, they don't have the luxury of time that you all had, but it certainly strikes me that this function, uh, you know, this focus on on problem solving and on, on not on jargon or slogans is a is a is a great lesson for those who who are tasked with making these these hard decisions. So I want to shift yeah, gears just to go, go ahead. I just, I just oh, shift gears a little bit. And you you alluded the pandemic. And I wanted to sort of talk about because that it's a massive externality, the pandemic and um, and then the George Floyd killing. I mean, that landed in the in the middle of this. Um, how did that impact your exchange? I'm sorry to interrupt, Rick, I, but I, I just think that's such no. a such so a it fascinating. Actually, yeah. And it may, maybe this actually segues a bit into that, because what I was yeah. going to say is, you know, uh, uh, another advantage pay, pay and I have besides not actually have to making decisions about anything uh, is we're also, we're not running organizations and we're kind of old enough and have enough stuff under our belts that we have some um, autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. I, for organizational leaders, for young people trying to make a name, you have to worry about your patrons, about how it plays on social media in a way that Pedro and I aren't as concerned about day to day, which mm -hmm. gives us, I think, more freedom to risk, um, mm -hmm. you know, annoying people who are in our camp. Well, I think the pandemic, I mean, I think one thing that that absolutely did is when suddenly an entire nation basically moves this conversation online, uh, you, you know, when you're looking, you know, when you're looking somebody in the face, when you're distracted by the day to day, you're going, you know, you're picking your kid up from school or you're going to a ball game, it, you know, there's a degree in which it keeps you anchored. And I think part for me of what was so striking was watching the whole country kind of lose its emotional and social anchor while we were doing this. And so for me, I mean, one part of what made this thing, I've said several times, um, it's one of the most heartening things I've done uh, in recent years, is I think maybe the tether, the social emotional tether it gave me uh, while the country was going this other way. Um, and so I think for me, that's one big piece of it was watching the pandemic play out um, and people just lose, the, uh, lose those moments in life when we just fall into the kinds of conversations mm -hmm. Pedro and I were, you know, were fortunate to be having. Yeah, I, 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 I like the fact that um, we were willing to acknowledge that we were in the middle of something historic, right? That is that we didn't stick with a script and just say, no, those are the topics we said we would cover. We said, no, something major, is, something historic is happening right now. We need to acknowledge this and, and, and write about it and talk about what this means. And, and um, I think that, you know, that we, I says a lot about Rick and, and, and his ability to take what he knows and applies it to what's happening, right? And um, because so many of the issues that we did write about that have been rehashed over and over and over again, it's hard to add something new to some of these debates, but um, the pandemic and the way it impacted everything, especially in education and, and kids' lives um, the racial justice movement, the way it disrupted our society, all these things require us to, to reflect and to think about, you know, what's happening around us, how do we make sense of it. Uh, someone said to me recently, and I really agree with it, you know, every problem facing our society, really facing the world, can be thought of as an educational problem, right? Mm -hmm. That is, how do we now prepare young people to respond to it? And I think if we, if we approach education that way, it keeps our future orientation very um, alive and, and vibrant and fresh. And um, that to me is important. Uh, um, there's nothing more boring than stale ideas. <laughs> and hearing the same thing over and over, I just get tired of it. I, I, I just give one example. There was a, a I thought a very good essay, an op-ed in the New York Times a week ago. Um, it was titled something like, uh, can we stop fighting about charter schools? 
-hmm. by a woman named uh, Eve Ewing. I thought it was very good. I shared it on social media. I had so many people attack me and the piece because they thought I was defending charter schools. And I just thought, wow, you know, the, the whole point of the article was to acknowledge, again, the complexity. And there are many people not ready for that, so. You know, and I think one of the things, both, um, you know, the unrest following, uh, you know, George Floyd's killing uh, and with the pandemic is, you know, so many of these lines that we get used to standing upon and kind of throwing the rocks back and forth suddenly don't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, to argue about whether choice is good or bad when 50 million children were locked out of school suddenly seems to like miss kind of the point. Like if the point should be, how do we make sure kids get the learning environments they need? Uh, to talk about teacher compensation in the abstract when suddenly teachers aren't doing the jobs that they were hired for. Like, so there's a degree to which the lines of demarcation in these debates seem like they need to evolve, but that's not, organizations are set up to do X, whatever their thing on. And people who like get, make it onto MSNBC or Fox or, you know, this or that sort of the issue are kind of deeply invested in their talking points and their quips. And so one of the things I think that being, having this pragmatic streak and having this kind of interest in understanding is the sense that look, the world in 2020, world of education 2020, was different than the world of education in 2000. And like, it is neither useful nor constructive nor interesting to pretend that none of that has happened. But if we can't talk outside of our camp, we wind up pretending as if the world is the same today as it was yesterday, as it was a decade ago. And so for me, I think, again, part of what the pandemic and the racial dynamics of the last year really just did was they just threw open these doors, which said, and you know, which amplified this notion that like, look, these things are not steady state, they change. And if we're gonna actually do good work on behalf of kids, on behalf of our, the nation, we've gotta be capable of engaging with the world as, it, as it's changing. And, it doesn't seem like it should be that darn hard, but it's just not the way we're used to doing business. So, so building on that, what do you hope that readers and the larger public really take away from this book? Um, do you have a, you know, you, you both talked about your respect for decision makers and the comparative luxury you all have in not, you know, not being, you know, direct decision makers. Um, but do you, um, do you have a piece of advice that you would give to those decision makers that you really learned along the way as you guys worked on this book? Yeah, Pedro, you want, say, you want to start? I'll, I'll go first. I, I would say um, be very skeptical of, of um, silver bullets, solutions, um, people who are selling um, the, you know, the answers to our educational system. You know, we're at a moment where the reformers, and I, in that camp, I would put the, the proponents of no child behind and, and the, the idea that if we just turn everything to charter schools and choice, everything will get better. Well, that hasn't panned out, right? At the same time, those who wanted to defend the status quo and, and, and would like to get led us to, to believe that everything was fine until no child behind, that reading of history is just inaccurate. I don't see any evidence that that was true. So then that raised the question, then what? Now what? What direction should we go in? If we really think that education is key to our future, and I believe that's true, then what should we do? And I think we have to stop believing that there's a script, that if I just follow this script, it'll all work out. There is no script. We have to figure it out. And we have to, we have to learn from our mistakes. We have to learn from the efforts of others. Um, we've got to look at evidence. Uh, we've got to be open to learning. And I, I think if anything, this moment is, has taught me avoid uh, believing in some recipe uh, for success because I don't see it. I don't think it exists. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so what do you think it would take to spark that 
kind of conversation. Because essentially, you, you know, the world is, you know, very different in 2021 than it was in 2019. And certainly, you know, since what, 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, like, what, like, how do we do that, right? How do we spark more of this kind of conversation rooted in respect and pragmatism evidence to help, you know, move forward, which we all agree this is, you know, education is, if not the most important, you know, component of a democracy, certainly in the top two or three. How do we do that? You know, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things we talk about a bit in the intro to the book is, you know, it's pretty clear to me that most Americans actually want much more of what Pedro and I were able to do in this. Um, that's not what you see on social media. That's not what you see on cable news. But I think the polling is pretty, pretty clear that all of this stuff gets driven by 20 or 30 percent of Americans. And meanwhile, the other 70, 80 percent of us or hunker down with our heads like this, mm -hmm. saying, oh my God, when this is gonna ease up. But mm -hmm. study after study show that the people who scream are the ones who get featured on, the, not on cable news. They're the ones who generate clicks online. These are the media stories that sell. So one part of the problem is that we have got a larger culture that has declared war on practicality and common sense and just basic decency. And that's a big issue. I don't know how we deal with that. Uh, when I think that's part of why what Pedro and I try to do here might be too big to talk about, it might be it might be too big a leap to talk about the utility for governors or members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's too big a leap to talk about it for school boards and mm -hmm. students and principals and teacher educators and schools of education. I think these are places where they have where the where that larger pool is gentle enough that you could go a different direction, but it's not what we're used to seeing. Um, it, it's not, we don't have a lot of models of how do you do this. Uh, so for instance, I would love to see uh, ed leadership programs um, making an effort to make sure that people who wanna be superintendents do what Pedro and I did in this book. They've gotta marry them up with somebody from the business school or somebody from the, or, or, or some mm -hmm. executive or somebody who comes at this from a different ideological predisposition, and they need to write back and forth and talk about these issues uh, in a way that's substantive. Universities need to figure out mechanisms for encouraging this and supporting it and giving credit for it. Um, they don't. In fact, you know, I, I've had Pedro uh, guest speak to class of mine, and you know, universities are so one note on this point that you know. Pedro comes off as to the right of every student in a seminar, which is just a mind boggling mm -hmm. situation for me. And universities need to, need to take a responsibility for this. School boards, principals, professional development needs to take seriously that we talk a lot about stakeholder buy-in. Uh, we talk a lot um, uh, uh, about um, you know, courageous conversations in education. Well, it ain't a courageous conversation for 50 progressives in an ed school to sit around and talk to each other. Conversations only get courageous when you're actually talking across our comfort level, across our divides with mutual respect. And so for me, I think what Pedro and I have modeled here um, is something that has wide applicability for educational leaders, for people preparing teachers, for folks in the business of leading school systems across the country. So Pedro, that's right in your wheelhouse. What, what do you think? Is that, is that where we ought to start sort of growing this, um, the, the lessons of, of this collaboration that you all did rather than with policymakers, but with what happens um, on campus and in the, the preparation of education leaders? I, I think so. I think universities um, shortchange their students if they expose them to only one way of looking at issues, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm troubled by that, but in my own courses, I would um, very intentionally assign readings that were at odds with what I thought, uh, because I wanted my students to know there's other people out there who think like this, and you need to understand if you disagree, why do you disagree? <laughs> it's not enough to say I disagree, why, right? Um, and I think it's, um, I see too much of the kind of group think um, on campuses, schools of education, perhaps even more so than other um, areas. And um, 
you know, people, I think a lot of times conservatives will say, well, that's, it's kind of liberal dominance. It's, I think there's um, some of that, but I think it's, it's, um, it's, I would, I would call it an intellectual laziness, right? Mm -hmm. To, to not read and, and take seriously the perspectives of those you disagree with is lazy on my, uh, it, I, I think. Um, you have to know why you disagree. It's not good enough. And, and this is a real danger in our society because we're increasingly getting our news and information from only uh, sources that we think resonate with our point of view. Um, mm -hmm. I, I worry about kids and how they're gonna, that's why I'd say I'm against censorship. I think we want students to be exposed to lots of ideas. The more important thing is that they know how to think critically. Why do you think, uh, I was, I, we've talked a lot a bit about, about what's going on on campus. Pedro, you said you think that uh, sort of the intellectual laziness of some group think on campus, but then you said you thought especially so in, in schools of education. Why do you think that and why do you think that is? I think because we, we want education to facilitate things like equality and justice. These are important values uh, for our society. Um, but how we do that is, is hard, right? It's messy, especially because we're asking education to solve problems that are economic mm -hmm. and political and rooted in our history. And um, I think that too often we don't, in, in the interest of seeming like we're on the right side, <laughs> we don't want to acknowledge the complexity and the difficulty. Um, now, let me be clear. There are many communities that are still teaching kids that, they're, you know, that, that God created the earth and the earth is only 6,000 years old and there's no such thing as evolution. And, and um, they, they want to, you know, they want to impose a different kind of dogma um, on children, which I think is dangerous for this country at this time. So um, I think you can go in either direction and find blind spots that work against our collective interest. It's in our interest as a nation to have educated citizens. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson knew that a long time ago. It's still true. <laughs> Democracy can't survive without it. And it's not simply about um, the standards. It's about knowing how to think. It's about think independently. And it's also knowing how to listen. And um, if kids don't learn that in school and if our universities don't practice it, uh, mm -hmm. democracy's in trouble. Now, I, uh, so I, I always like to sort of end a conversation like this, particularly with, um, with smart people in education um, about talking about a teacher that had an impact in your life. So um, could each of you, could you name one or more than one that um, was, had a particular impact and what made them so, so special to you? Rick, I'll start with you. Sure, sure. Um, you know, for me, it was Selma Ziff, uh, sixth grade teacher uh, of mine um, in Fair Fairfax County, Virginia, great school system where I had had uh, miserable experience and where I would go on to have miserable experience, uh, <laughs> but one phenomenal year. And, uh, you know, I wrote about her at length in Letters to Young Ed Reformer, but, you know, she was just, she was just a gifted pedagogue. Uh, we uh, started, you know, we, she, you know, was she a constructivist or was she, she was everything. Uh, we started every day by doing a, by hand, uh, you know, addition, subtraction, division, and a multiplication problem. And she would track them for every student for the quarter. And if you got 45 out of 45, uh, you know, all four right 45 days in a row, she had prizes and awards and ribbons. And you get sixth grade boys excited about uh, acing their long division each day for, you know, it's not an easy lift. We would do, you know, this was a long time ago, obviously. This was, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, so this was before you had technology, but she had these complex simulations where you would be doing social studies. We were doing, uh, you know, all manner of literature and uh, theater. You know, it was when you think about an educator who just threw herself into trying to make the classroom come alive every day who made every child kind of feel welcome in that classroom, who was just focused, not on so many of these debates that we enjoy so much, 
but of just making school a place that even like a disaffected mediocre student like me would just feel really like interested and excited when, when you showed up in the morning to see what was going to happen that day. Like to me, like that has always been the model when I've found myself in front of a classroom of what I aspire to, just somebody who makes the act of learning in all of its dimensions for all of these different kids in there, um, just something spectacular. That's amazing, Rick. How about you, Pedro? You have one that oh, you I really have, remember? I have several, um, but given our, our conversation, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, an eighth grade social studies teacher I had, uh, Ed Hardman. And, and one thing we didn't mention is both Rick and I are former social studies teachers too. Mm -hmm. So um, in eighth grade, I had this teacher and um, he, I liked him. I, what I liked about him is he used a lot of humor and he made um, the, 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 uh, the study of American history funny and interesting. One day I brought a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X to class and he reacted right away. He said, I don't want that book in my class. He's a racist. I said, have you ever read it? And he was stopped. He said, no. I said, how do you know he's a racist? He says, wow, well, everything I know about him, he's a racist. I said, you should read the book <laughs> before you make a judgment. Did you, don't you teach us that? Don't judge a book by its cover? And he said, okay, okay. And he says, so he challenged me to write a book report and which I did and presented about Malcolm X. And what I admired about him in addition to the fact that I thought he was a very good teacher, was his willingness to at least admit that he had taken an action that he was in, in uh, and really a, a evidence of hypocrisy on his own part. Because he had taught us, don't judge a book by its cover, don't just react, and here he was doing that, that, that very thing in class. So to me, that modeled the kind of teaching and thinking I think we should encourage. Don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> Don't be so quick to react. Try to understand another person's perspective. Even, it doesn't mean you buy it. It simply means you understand where they're coming from. I think uh, our society would be a lot better off if there was more of that. No, that's that's great. Um, uh, no, I, 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 I didn't realize that you were both social studies, social studies teachers. Um, so um, we've covered enough, we had some uh, some questions from the audience. We've covered a lot of them in the in the conversation uh, that we've had here. Um, one um, I did want to put the um, the role of education in democracy. Um, there's a um, we, we have what we've all sort of known that those of us in this line of work, but particularly you're starting to see it uh, an interest in civic education and and civic engagement, and particularly since the events of of January sixth. Um, what do you all make of that? And do you see any particular effort or organization that you are that uh, that you're most excited about, or or you think um, has the potential to be most impactful in this moment? Um, Pedro, let's start with you. Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about this. In fact, um, one of the things I've done since uh, becoming dean at USC is to launch an initiative we call the Democracy Project to try to address this problem. And then I start thinking, okay, well, how do we address it? <laughs> what could we do? <laughs> And what, so we, what we've settled on is developing a MOOC, right? Uh, I don't even know what MOOC stands for, but basically it's an open course mm -hmm. aimed at high school students on civics. Mm -hmm. And um, we're gonna focus the first one on immigration. Um, mm -hmm. And we're gonna look both at the history of immigration and then different perspectives um, on immigration. And we're gonna offer a parallel course for teachers on how to mm -hmm. teach controversial subjects in the classroom. Because I think, you know, first of all, as a nation of immigrants, if we can't have an intelligent conversation about what should be our approach to immigration, we're in trouble because this economy can't survive without immigrants, as we know. Um, and hopefully kids can, and I know there are kids ready and willing to grapple with that in a way that I think will help them uh, beyond school. So. Um, I've actually asked Rick to be one of our advisors on the course. I'll be following up with him soon. <laughs> That's great. Rick, how about you? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, civics has been <laughs> a passion of mine forever. And it's funny when the, the education cognoscenti decide that it actually matters. So I remember in 2014, you couldn't get them interested in it. Suddenly Trump wins the election and it's a huge issue. 
But it seemed to be a huge issue for many of the people um, I know in this work, because the purpose of civic education, and you know, I, um, because the purpose of civic education, as they seem to see it starting 2016, was making sure that people wouldn't vote Republican. Um, after all, in 2016, after the 2016 election, 45% of Democrats said it had not been a free and fair election. That might have seemed to be a problem. This creeping notion of democratic illegitimacy might have been the focus. Now, today, we've obviously just seen an election where more than 80% of Republicans say the election wasn't free and fair. It's nuts. We just saw a CPAC where rather than being regarded um, as a destructive, dishonest, uh, treasonous embarrassment, uh, Donald Trump was welcomed as a conquering hero. And people explained that, yes, indeed, this has been still. So look, um, you know, Pedro talks about some of the laziness and challenges, say, in ed schools. And he's right that they, you can find these anywhere in American society. It's just you don't find a lot of right wing schools of education right now. So I think the challenge there is one kind. But certainly on the right, we have all of our own challenges with intellectual laziness. Mm -hmm. And so given, given that it's really hard, it seems to me, to run a free nation, a responsible nation, a democratic nation, when citizens don't believe in democratic elections, when they don't actually show any ability to distinguish between fact and fantasy, when they are loath to actually engage in hard questions, yeah, civic education is huge and crucial. But what I do worry about is how readily it can become a stalking horse for all of the ideological debates that Pedro and I you know, wrote this book to get away from and how hard it can be to talk about civics education in a way that's kind of respectful to the core challenges of teaching students to love and appreciate all that's been done to make this nation what it is while having their eyes wide open as to all of its shortcomings and failings, um, finding a civics education that makes students care and gets them engaged, that teaches them core pr principles and skills. Um, it seems to me, again, a classic case where we can have a practical, constructive conversation, but for a lot of folks, I fear it's a lot, lot more interesting to just have the same old food fight. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the acid test of every one of these initiatives to improve civic education is, are they, show, are they actually willing to stand up to the food fighters? And are they actually creating a space and, and, and a shield for folks to tackle this differently? Uh, no, this has been a, um, a fantastic uh, conversation. I enjoyed the conversation as, as much as I, and as much as I enjoyed the book. Um, I, as I just think about, you know, sort of, you know, lessons to take away from this book, it's as much in, in what you wrote as in what you just modeled here, I think, the, the notion of, of respect, of respect for arguments, of listening, of, con of, you know, sort of considering different points of view, mm -hmm. and a different point of view is okay, but part of it is what I really hear you all saying is, to respect different points of view and the ultimate act of respect is to listen to them, understand them, not necessarily cave to them or you know, accede to them. Um, I really do think you, uh, that you have lessons for, um, for, I think you said local, local leaders, teachers, school board members, and that, you know, that, and to remember that the audience, whether the people watching this or people reading your book are not uh, are not like what get, are not like people who are most active on Twitter or you see on NBC, MSNBC or Fox, um, or that get the most clicks, um, and that this is um, this is this is hard work, and it is the essence of of our democracy and the essence of our uh, of our education, and it's work over time. I I am struck that you said that one of your um, you know, top recommendations to policymakers and advocates, aside from stop screaming and start listening, was that there are no silver bullets. And both of you seem not only respectful to each other, but willing to um, call out or respectfully disagree with people on your own side. And I do think that the part of tribalism uh, that we focus on tends to be how people are screaming at people they disagree with. And yet what I hear from both of you all is, you know, sometimes the, the most productive thing may be to call out folks on your folks on your own side, productive and maybe the most difficult. 
And, uh, and then as, uh, as a fellow letter writer, um, I, what I really see is that um, the, the ancient art of, of letter writing certainly seems to have made some very contemporary progress. And I hope that, uh, that people who read this and who watch this will draw uh, that lesson um, of an ancient art that clearly has been an extremely productive um, enterprise for, um, for the two of you and a an very enjoyable conversation for me. So thank you all very much for the time and for the terrific book. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Thank you.